It's been lovely being here with you, dear. It is with regret I have to go. I'll be thinking of you, don't you fear, dear. With a happy heart that loves you so. Pleasant dreams to you, dear. May they all come true, dear. In your slow. This is a home, and this is a home. Wherever you go in the wide world, you know that there are many animals about you. Sometimes you can see them. Sometimes you can't. Many will hide from you because they're afraid you might hurt them. And they build their homes where they'll be hidden or where enemies will have a hard time reaching them. The cliff swallows build nests high out of reach under an overhanging rocky ledge. They gather mud in their beaks and fly back with it to make their homes. High on a cliff, they can raise their families safe from the weather above and from danger below. Each kind of bird has its own way of protecting its nest. Some, like the red-winged blackbird, make their homes beside a pond where they'll be hidden in the tall reeds. Many birds build their nests in the branches of a tree. Some nest on the ground. And some are even able to make a hole in a tree trunk. The reason for the nest is the same to have a home to raise a family. And all families are the same. They have big appetites. It's hard to believe that in only four weeks these scrawny little birds will be big enough to fly out into the big world. They won't need a home for another year when they'll build nests to raise families of their own. What other reasons are there for having a home? Have you ever stopped to think what ants use their home for? Well, for one thing, they use it as a place to store food. These worker ants are taking seeds down into their underground storerooms. Ants live together, sometimes many thousands, in one colony. 
down in their long underground tunnels they're safe from their enemies here are ants working to make the tunnels longer and way up at the top of the picture is another ant who's trying to move a big pebble each ant in the colony has its own job these are the nurses that take care of the young ones the babies are white at this stage they can't move or take care of themselves does it seem to you that ants build a good safe place to raise their young and store food and live their lives many kinds of spiders build homes You've all seen big round spider webs, but here's a different kind, one with a tunnel to hide in. The spider spins a flat web out in front of the tunnel to trap food. Spiders are helpful because they kill so many of the insects that bother us. Close by, this spider has built another web where she's laid her eggs. After the baby spiders hatch, the web is their home until they're big enough to build their own. We've all seen homes built by spiders and ants and birds, but not many of us know about a gallfly's home. Out in the woods, you may have seen strange round things on trees or bushes. These grow wherever the gallfly lays an egg in the bark. When the egg hatches, the young one has a fine home to grow in, complete with food and protection from its enemies. When it's grown to the right size, it makes a hole and crawls out to live the rest of its life. Who do you think this is making a tunnel just under the surface? A mole. You won't often see a mole. Most kinds live underground all their lives and can't even see if they're brought out into the light. Look at those short, strong front legs that he uses for digging. And that long, sharp nose that tells him where his breakfast is. He'd much rather get back to his home underground. Watch how fast he can dig. Great many animals make their homes underground. Here's another fellow, a gopher. He builds a bigger tunnel than the mole does, so he has to push some of the dirt up to the surface. Watch how he pushes with his chest and front legs. A gopher never goes far from his tunnel even to look for food. When he runs out of food in one place, he digs underground to another place. This way, he may dig a tunnel a mile long in a year. That's a long home, isn't it? For some animals, a tree is a favorite place to live. An old hollow tree is a home ready-made to move in and start housekeeping. That scraggly-looking creature is a mother possum. She's carrying something on her back. Do you know what it is? 
It's her family of young possums. Riding on mother is rough going. A fella has to hang on tight if he doesn't want to get tossed off. Why do you suppose a mother possum puts up with this? Well, when you were a baby, your mother used to take you with her when she left the house. A mother possum doesn't leave her babies home alone either. She takes them along even though they grab hold with all four paws and their teeth. Hang on now. They made it home again. Here's another mother doing what mothers so often do, making the bed and tidying up around the home. This animal is called a coatamundi, coati for short. Like other mothers, she has young ones that sometimes interfere with the housework. Does anything like this ever happen around your home? It's fun to play, but it's good to have a home to go to when the play is over. Would you like to learn more about the way animals live? Do you know whether bears have homes? Would you be surprised to find out that deer and many other animals have no homes at all? And what about fish? Do they have homes? Do you know how bees live? What do you know about rabbits? And squirrels? And mice? Where does the coyote go when he's tracked down his dinner? And where does the mountain lion go when he's finished his? You'll want to know more about a home and what it means. Without a home, many could not live at all. A home is a safe place and a good place. Unlock the door to wild adventures Wednesdays at the zoo. Wednesday is Keeper's Key Day and it's extra special because keepers will talk with you on taking care of animals. From aardvarks to zebras. And when you make a Wednesday visit to the zoo, we'll give you a special Keeper Key card. Use your Keeper's card on two more Wednesdays and your next visit's free. Don't miss it. Keeper's Key Day every Wednesday at the zoo. Wild adventures wait for you at the Cincinnati Zoo. Why not turn off the water when you're brushing your teeth instead of running it continuously? Use a cup for rinsing. This can save up to 80% of the water used in your bathroom. It's one of hundreds of things that we can do for our environment. Let's do it now! For your free booklet, contact Environment Center. You are watching Sleepcore, media for sleep. About 1,700,000 years ago, 
man first appeared on the face of the earth. But such creatures as the jellyfish, the hydrozoa and the coral have inhabited the sea for at least one billion years. The simplest multicellular animals are called cellenterates because of the structure of the cellentra. The forms, colors and rhythmic movements of these tiny creatures living in harmony with their environment are beautiful to observe. It is a system of life where all living things coexist and function efficiently, either individually or in groups. Rationality and beauty are synonymous with them. Living together does not mean living side by side without interfering with one another, for they also prey on each other in a relation of mutual exploitation found throughout nature. In this film, we're going to explore some of the mystery of this underwater world captured through the eye of a camera. We will see how the living things behave in a fantastically complicated but well-organized way. Hydrozoas, which resemble flowers on the earth in appearance, survive by catching smaller creatures than themselves. They prefer different places to live, according to the species. Some of them grow on seaweeds, some on shells or fish, and others cling to the sand or rocks on the bottom of the sea. Salenterates in this stage are called polyps by biologists. The polyps of hydrozoa duplicate by budding, growing roots, or separating branches like plants. Some hydrozoas have a two-stage life cycle, a fixed stage of polyp and a swimming stage of jellyfish called medusa. Medusa buds grow on the polyps, enlarge and then leave them. The medusas have sexual distinctions and duplicate sexually. They can exist as medusa only under certain conditions, just as the plants on the earth grow flowers only in particular seasons. The medusa buds growing on the polyps differ in number and location according to the species. For example, some polyps grow buds on their stems and others on their roots or on a part very close to their roots. This is true even in the case where the baby medusas may look exactly like those of a very similar species. Also, some polyps have a division of labor between catching prey and duplication. Let's look at the medusa buds more closely, taking cladonema as an example. The small projections under their tentacles grow into buds. Next, organs, highly sensitive to light, which the polyps do not have, and tentacles begin to appear. And then the buds enlarge, spreading their tentacles outward and begin to heat up. By this time, they try to capture plankton by shooting poisonous needles, which are stored in nematocyst capsules at the end of their tentacles.
Here, baby jellyfish called the Medusa bud, still attached to its parent polyp, tries to capture prey together with its parent. And here, another polyp steals the prey captured by a nearby Medusa bud. When a Medusa bud is able to absorb the prey into its own stomach for the first time, it is a sign that it will soon be independent. This scene takes place just several hours before it becomes fully liberated from its parent. The Cyphozoa family, which includes the moon jellyfish, is much larger and has a more complex structure. Whitish polyps become many layers of reddish-brown strobilla, and soon each layer begins to become separated into ephyra larvae. The ephyra gradually metamorphosize through the so-called nephephyra stage. A two to three millimeter ephyra grows into a large jellyfish with a bell 20 to 30 centimeters in diameter. Numerous tentacles extend from the brink of the bell, at the center of which is a large mouth surrounded by four oral appendages that flutter to and fro. About one billion years ago, the first solenterates made their appearance. But it is not known whether jellyfish or polyps were the first to appear. Hydrozoa and Cyphozoa have gone through two different phases as jellyfish and as polyps from time immemorial. This is not to say that they have not changed at all. They still retain a simple bodily structure, but have come to assume various forms according to the place and conditions in which they live. Thus, over a long, long period of time, creating those forms which are most suitably adapted to each particular environment. At birth, the Equoria jellyfish is only one millimeter in length and has but two tentacles. A few months later, it has many tentacles and has grown a bell 20 centimeters in diameter. The bell of the Storocladia jellyfish has degenerated over the centuries and looks as if it has been squashed. It weaves its way among the seaweed, not swimming, but using its highly developed tentacles to pull itself along. The Sarsia jellyfish, which inhabits the cold northern sea, has a long stomach when it reaches adulthood. These 
these are gastroblasta with many stomachs. Some hydrozoas duplicate non-sexually, not only from polyps, but also by division or budding. Here, young raphkia with immatured sexual organs generate jellyfish directly from jellyfish. Some polyp-like jellyfish exist which cling to the surface of seaweed and never swim. Thus the way of life varies greatly among the salentorates. A plain of seaweed in the northern sea near the shore is an important life space for many creatures. The Gonionemus jellyfish, with a 1.5 centimeter in diameter bell, appears there in the summer. It has adapted well to the environment. With tentacles shaped like hooks, it can swim vigorously among the weeds and also grasp seaweed firmly. This is very convenient for catching a larger prey. The poison stored in their tentacles is strong and causes great pain to whomever they touch. The Spirocodon, native to Japan, is a winter jellyfish. As the end of autumn approaches, their tiny offspring make their appearance in a creek, and within a few months, they have grown to become large, beautiful jellyfish, only to disappear in spring after laying their own eggs. But it is still not known how these jellyfish live during the polyp stage. Thus, there is still much mystery about the Salenterex. This is one of my favorite places. It's a marsh that's managed and maintained by Ducks Unlimited. And its sole purpose is to provide a habitat for ducks, geese, birds, mammals, and fish. That gets to be a more important and difficult job each year. And we need your help to keep on doing it. I hope you can attend the Ducks Unlimited fundraising event in your town. Many margarines. But chiffon tastes good enough to fool Mother Nature. Tastes so sweet and creamy, so much like butter. All you'll ever want is more chiffon. You'll see. Tastes like butter. Mm, so many margarines. But chiffon's good enough to fool Mother Nature. It tastes like butter, but it's not. It's chiffon. You're watching Sleepcore. Media for Sleep.
The comb jelly family, which is a kind of relative of the celenterates, has eight rows of cilia, which have the appearance of combs. When light is reflected on the cilia as they move to and fro in a regular manner, they shine like a rainbow. Their body is too fragile even to keep specimens of. Having no polyp stage, they spend their whole life in a form that is able to swim. Found in the sea around Japan, they are brought from the southern sea by the Japan stream. In that warm southern sea, there is a large world of celenterates. It is the coral reef sea. Masses of celenterate create underwater scenes reminiscent of mountains, valleys and plains on the face of the earth itself. It is mainly composed of large bone corals which form a big colony. Compared with other celenterate such as the hydrozoa and cyphozoa, individual corals are not so different in size, but their colonies are far larger than those of the jellyfish. Horny corals capture their polyp-covered prey by spreading their bodies against the current of the tide, like trees braced against the wind. And other creatures make use of the corals for shelter and habitation, just as living things on Earth use trees and vegetation. pieces of bone which are distributed all over their bodies. The Xenia family opens and closes its tentacles restlessly. looks quiet and calm, but is in fact very much alive, as many kinds of creatures incessantly go about their activities. The corals in shallower waters are green or brown, because a great number of unicellular plants called zooxanthella live inside them engaged in the process of photosynthesis with the abundant sunshine. The stony coral family is different from the soft corals we've described in that they have hard lime bones and keep their polyps closed during the daytime, except for fungia actiniformis, goniopora, euphilia, etc. The zooxanthella living in the Sinenkin can thus enjoy the sunshine and engage in photosynthesis without being bothered by the polyps on the coral. And the stony coral can absorb the calcium in the water, taking advantage of the oxygen provided by the zooxanthella, thereby building up a huge colony supported by the lime bones.
Thus, the corals perform a part of the role that the vegetation on the earth does, though they are actually animals. Over a period of several thousand years, a huge aggregation of stony coral colonies has created elevated coral islands, where the coral reefs work as a water break, permitting an abundant number of creatures to live there and contribute to our human life. Sheltered safely under coral reefs, small fish developed particularly gorgeous shapes and colours. Corals also fall prey to other animals. For example, Acanthasta cranthorn sea stars devour stone corals completely, leaving only the bones. Occasionally, Acanthastas increase to abnormal proportions and exterminate an entire coral reef. But usually, they are only one of the living things that inhabit it. The white sandy bottom of the sea around coral reefs consists mainly of disintegrated coral bones. Although at first glance it looks deserted, here also various creatures are evident, some searching for prey, others engaged in the process of reproduction, and still others taking up residence. Cavernularia sea pen, a soft coral, keeps its body half buried in the sand to catch its prey.
Cassiopeia root-mouth jellyfish, which inhabit the sand of a coral reef, lies flat on the lowest part of the sand with its bell upside down, and even remains upside down while swimming. Actinodendron sea anemone looks extremely similar to the Cassiopeia root mouth jellyfish. It lives in the sandy area and is extremely poisonous. This creature, half buried in the sand and extending and retracting its tentacles to capture its prey, is not a sea anemone, but a species of sea cucumber, hiding most of its body from view. It is Cucumaria at dinner. Adaptation of life to the sand has helped to form its peculiar shape. different species of animals share in common symbiosis. For example, various fish of the Parmacentridae family, or clownfish, share life with large tropical sea anemones such as Radianthus, Stoicactus, Physobrachia, etc. Clownfish are especially possessive, and one will not allow another to approach his own sea anemone. If then more than one clownfish are seen with one sea anemone, they are either a mating pair, or parents with offspring that are not yet able to live independently. anemone can manage without clownfish, but in the natural environment of the coral reef, clownfish cannot live without sea anemone. The offspring of the kingfish live with Physonostoma, the large jellyfish which are their only reliable companions. What help would it be to the jellyfish to be accompanied by a fish? When the camera approaches the jellyfish to take its picture, the fish tries to lead it away in a hurry. century, we live at a time when the very few areas as yet unexplored by man are fast disappearing. Perhaps it can be said that the only places left replete with the unknown are the vast reaches of space and the sea. Just as the distant space is full of the unknown, so too is the nearby sea. There is nothing so unwavering as man's desire to explore such regions. It is impossible and unnecessary to answer the question as to why he feels so impelled. Suffice to say that the pursuit of knowledge is a heartfelt demand given in the nature of man. 
it is a limitless and strong aspiration. The study of the Salentaris in Japan, which began with the study of those in the Northern Sea, is gradually but steadily developing into the study of those in the Southern Sea. Observing the ecology of the living creatures in the sea is a difficult thing. But with our developments in electronics, we can say that the door is now opening to a hitherto unfathomable world. You are watching Sleepcore, media for sleep. country may be in danger. We could be losing something we can't afford to lose. Once in this country, when a man produced a product, it was the best he could possibly make. He stood behind it with pride. He lived a simple idea. Do it right or don't do it at all. Nobody told him that. No government agency dictated it. And it built a standard of living for the world to aim at. Now that idea is threatened by the slipshod, the second rate. To some, it means quick riches. To some, it means quick death of the standards we have built. Some are fighting this threat. Whirlpool Corporation believes in one simple idea, to continue to design, build, and service home appliances the right way, with pride, so you can live with them comfortably for years, or they will not build them at all. If we can't keep this simple idea alive, then indeed we are the endangered species. Sun, at 20 million degrees centigrade, reaches the Tropic of Capricorn, its furthest point in the southern... ...over half of North America. This is the day of the longest shadows, the shortest day of all, December 21st. 2,400 years ago, the Celts lit bonfires to strengthen the expiring sun on this day. For nature, winter is a testing time and a time of superlative life. All organisms must increase their resistance to the cold. Dehydration of body tissues, denser fur or feathers, more fat, migration or hibernation. In the Rockies, the white-tailed deer must dig for their food. But when the snows get deep, and they may go to 10 feet, the deer will rely on available trees. Rocky Mountain Bighorn, 
bunched together for mutual aid. They live along the continental divide. The temperature drops to 20 below and sometimes stays there for weeks on end. The wind can double the chill factor. Winter is the long sleep for hibernators. Their pulse may drop to four or five times a minute, but not for everyone. The muskrat, really an overgrown field mouse, out isn't stopped at all by the coming of winter. He has his lodge under ice to keep him warm. It has walls up to a foot thick and any number of plunge holes, so he's never frozen over. Killdeer isn't necessarily bothered by the cold in the high western slopes. He wades right into the nearest hot spring. Lives in the luxury of steam heat from the Earth's core. When the Earth was still young, great jets of water vapor, carbon monoxide, and other gases erupted through the cooling crust. They formed the atmosphere which was poisonous and lifeless at first, over a surface of spewing volcanoes for maybe millions of years. Killdeer gets the benefits of all that in his own heated pool. He gets his name because of his lonely, repeated crying. Why he cries, Killdeer, nobody knows. Muskrat is still at it in his pond. In winter, he lives mainly on roots, doesn't store much. Instead, he relies on his ability to dive and gnaw loose what he wants. The muskrat holds his tail rigid as a rudder for swimming, and that undercoat of super fur is perfectly waterproof. It's his fur that man, the predator, wants. The take, 20 million pelts a winter. But mother may turn out 18 young a season. She drives them out of the house at only four weeks old. By then, she's usually pregnant again. Snow can be a great insulator, unless you stick to the trees like the porcupine. He's addicted to the inner bark, rich in sugar and starch. He often takes the best of trees, leaves them spiked, topless, and useless. The prairie dog's thoroughly social. He used to live in cities, but now he's becoming a loner, like the porcupine. Once in the Texas Panhandle, prairie dogs built up a rodent megalopolis that ran for 200 miles and contained an estimated 400 million of them. They ate everything in sight, so we poisoned them. A few hundred got away. Now they're protected in their own park. The bighorn in winter coat roughs it in the high country, 
his last refuge. In 1800, there were two million of them. By the 1950s, only 19,000 were left. They suffered from poor range, picked up the same diseases as domestic sheep, and lost their heads to trophy hunters. The ram is distinguished by the curl of his horns. It takes seven years for them to come around. In the high ridges, they start fighting, butting heads in November, looking for ewes. By the time mating is over, they may have broken horns and even massive headaches. That white humpback, the mountain goat, the Rockies they live in are threatened by strip mining. The overburden is just bulldozed off the mountain. The coal seam is taken. No reclamation is done. The result, landslides, fouled rivers, and loss of wildlife. And the big operations are just beginning. of North America have no rival for their changeability, and nowhere is there greater difference between regions. Tropical air comes from the Gulf of Mexico, polar air from the Arctic. The polar front dominates in winter, may cause a temperature drop of 62 degrees in just 150 miles. The snow geese that bred in the Arctic just a few months ago fly south to escape the deep freeze. now while away their winter on the Gulf and the California coast. There are more of them than any other geese, possibly because we don't like their taste. trumpeter swan, largest waterfowl there is, five and a half feet long. He got protection, but took 60 years to build back the flock to just 1,500. We took his breeding grounds for farms, his skin to line muffs and to make powder puffs. The great blue heron. His feathers once went for $32 an ounce for women's hats. Killing for feathers was finally outlawed, luckily for him. Salt marshes in winter. Southern California, the Salton Sea. Birds that have come here want only rest, and they get it. In winter, there's a period when their sex organs won't respond to any stimulus. When spring comes, warmth, rainfall, and food supply will contribute to regeneration and the start of breeding. When that time comes, it's the male who's usually ready first. He sometimes holds food or nest building material in his bill to give his intended the idea. In the high desert, the only way to survive in winter is to adapt. Rainfall may be five inches a year, and it may be none. So the pioneers named the giant yucca the Joshua tree for its praying outstretched arms.
Almost all desert dwellers go underground to escape the heat, even in winter. The burrowing owl doesn't do much burrowing if he can help it. He'd rather take over somebody else's home. seems unchanged from the time the prospectors, the desert rats, panning for gold, led their burrows over it. It endures, like the lizard, on almost nothing. But like the Arctic, the desert is most easily despoiled. Even small scars will last 30 years. This forgotten land is always in need of special protection. of the winter rains bring out the spectacular blooms in the desert. Eons ago, the earliest flowering plants depended on wind to cross-pollinate male and female. But then insects and birds did the job so much better that the flowers got flashier and the perfume more fragrant as a come on to make pollination more likely. to the desert in late winter just for nectar. Until the discovery of America, no European had seen a hummingbird or anything like it. The hummer comes on like a bomb, a small one, may tip the scales at just one-tenth of an ounce. He can zoom to 55 miles an hour and is the only one in the sky who can fly backwards. He himself has been hunted since the days of the Aztecs. The Indians used to wear him as an earring Victorian England made him into artificial flowers and dust catchers. 400,000 skins went to auction in London in just one week before the trade was stopped. Montana Territory. Back in 1867, a cowboy named Charlie Goodnight started big-time cattle grazing on the Great Plains. Soon there were four million Texas longhorns eating away the buffalo grass. The buffalo didn't need it. They were being slaughtered at the rate of a million a year. Bighorn, the Mustang is all that's really left. The misfit that's been there ever since, misused, abused, the legend that won't lay down. No, they couldn't quite kill off the Mustang, and it wasn't that nobody tried. There were hundreds of thousands of them once. They ran wild all over the West, like the deer. began for money. We hunted down the horses with planes. They were herded then by ropers, choked, strung together with wire through their noses. We gouged out their eyes, 
sold them for pet food. It was the Mustang that won the West, first for the Spaniards, then for the Indians, and finally for us. There might be none left now, but a woman called Wild Horse Annie out of Reno saw them blinded in their own blood on the way to slaughter and launched a 20-year war to save them. They run with the mule deer now in the first wild horse range in the country. It was set aside in 1968 in the Pryor Mountains along the Wyoming-Montana border, some of the toughest back country anywhere. But it's home for the Mustang. There's no round up here. Maybe 200 head are safe. The battle is far from won. Some governments still claim the public has the wrong idea about the Mustang, that they're runted, deformed, inbred and pathetic, and should be destroyed. up here is so thin in the winter they eat snow and bark right off the scrub trees, even the wood underneath when they're starving. The weak often make it somehow just until they see green grass, then die. There is no emergency feeding. The money's gone instead to fence in their scrubby last rain. are that the stallion must always fight off others to hold any of his harem of mares. And a lot of swapping goes on, so there is healthy interbreeding. The horses are small, but fantastic survivors. They can live on sagebrush and roots, stay alive on half what other horses eat, and can run a horse into the ground on their rocky home range. Mountain animal. The rancher knows why. 